welcome everyone to another installment of the Nano Educators Quarterly Forum. For everyone, for anyone that's new, this is a community that started two and a half years ago that's very much community driven. This uh, came from a collaboration from Daniela Duran as Nano at Stanford, Mariel Kolker as physics science teacher in New Jersey and our office, the National Technology Coordination Office. Uh, we take input from you guys on what you want to see and what you want to learn from. Uh, and the last couple of sessions, we'll be hearing an interest in learning about careers in nanotechnology and materials that you can bring back to your classroom, uh, about resources for your students, or just telling them a little bit more about what they can do if they choose a career in nanotechnology. We have a, an amazing panel today composed of a, a current uh, community college student, Lillian, who's now an, uh, an intern at Stanford. We have a community college professor, Peter, and we have the education and outreach coordinator for the NNCI site in, uh, I wanna say Minnesota, Ap apologies, yes, yes. Uh, but before we dive in, I just wanted to make a quick announcement for all the lovers of nanotechnology, or if you are new in nanotechnology, October 9, 10 to the negative 9, is National Nanotechnology Day. And there's a lot of fun activities that you can bring to your classroom. And I will put a link to some resources on the chat. But um, I would also like to announce that we are pairing up nanoscientists and nanoengineers to do virtual visits to your classroom. We have five spots left, and we would love to have someone visit your classroom and talk more about nano with your students. If you're interested, um, please email me or Patrice Pages, and I would put that information in the chat as well, so we can get you paired up. Um, if uh, time doesn't permit you to have a visitor, we have lots of fun activities that you can do in five to 10 minutes in your classroom. With that, um, and without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Lillian, so we can start our panel. Hi, my name is Lillian, and currently I'm interning at one of Stanford's um, nano facility. So a little bit about me is that currently I'm a community college student at Fianza and um, Foothill. Um, some background information about like my technical experience is that I've been working in the manufacturing um that I've been working in the manufacturing facility for almost like four years now. So what I do is that I test um, semiconductor chips. Um, these are like some images of what chips I test at the facility. Um, so a fun fact about me, like you see the picture um, below uh, is that um, I take, or I like learning more about like uh, different things such as automotive oh automotive so um, that's me just like learning how to solder um, what I do as an intern at Stanford is that um, I learn more about the tools in my facility so these are some tools that I um, am currently like learning and working on so for um, the me metal deposition tool the KGL evaporator what it does is that um, it basically um, um, melt metal onto your sa sample, so it evaporates onto your sample. And then another tool that um, I'm using is um, an Oxford RIE, which etches your sample, which is like, it removes like um, any like layer that you have on your sample. And um, this is me with um, one of the staff, um, engineers. Um, I'm just taking down notes on what he has to say about the KGL evaporator. Um, this is me. Um, uh, on the the right is me like during open house of last year. Um, we are going to hold another open house um, this year in October. Um, Daniela will talk more about it later. But um, yeah, as an intern, I'm able to like um, work on projects that I never um, knew that I could like learn about um, just more um, towards academia and research compared to uh, my experience of working corporate um, I get to um, learn things that I never thought I would 
learn about. Um, yeah, what interest what interested me in nanotechnology was that um, I wanted to learn more about like what I'm testing in the manufacturing facility that I worked in. Um, and I just want to build more of my experience. So that's how I found um, Nano at Stanford. Is there any questions? Thank you, Lillian. I think we can we can wait for the questions after all oh, okay, the panelists okay, uh, okay. introduce themselves. Peter, yeah. thank you, Lillian. Okay. Um, Peter, please take the floor. Thanks, Maria, and uh, it's great to see everybody, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Kazarnoff, and I'm faculty at Portland Community College, and I teach both uh, technicians and engineers, uh, some of whom uh, go on to work in the semiconductor industry, and I'm just going to briefly talk about some technician careers in nanotechnology. Um, these careers and these stories come from the Talking Technicians podcast, uh, which is a podcast which is produced by our National Science Foundation project. And if you uh, take a picture of the QR code, uh, that'll lead you to our podcast site. And uh, you can listen to it on your phone uh, or on any internet connected device. So the first technician that I just want to quickly talk about is Janaki. Uh, Janaki works in uh, nanotechnology in the semiconductor industry. Uh, Janaki works for a company called Analog Devices uh, that make analog microchips. Um, and Janaki was a student at uh, Portland Community College, uh, where I'm a faculty member of. So those nanotechnology careers, you can definitely go and work in semiconductors. So someone else that we've interviewed on the podcast is Sophia. Uh, Sophia went to community college in California, and she currently works in biotechnology, um, and nanotechnology gets uh, used in biotechnology at companies like Genentech, where she works for both uh, drug encapsulation as well as uh, drug delivery. And then uh, the last person that I wanted to talk about uh, was Antonio. Um, Antonio uh, works in nanotechnology and laser technology, and Antonio is a technician at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, and uh, Antonio's career um, has also been pretty long, and he's been able to uh, move from one part of um, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, to another part of uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So I just wanted to highlight that there are a lot of nanotechnology careers uh, for technicians. Uh, if you go to a two-year community college, uh, you can definitely then go on and uh, work in nanotechnology. Thank you, Peter. Jim, you have the floor. Thank you, Maria. Can you see my screen? Not yet. We can see it now. Okay, very good. My name is Jim Marty. I'm a senior scientist here at the Minnesota Nano Center at the University of Minnesota. And in that capacity, I run a couple of laboratories that work with uh, nanomaterials and the biological applications of nano to the life sciences and to biomedical devices. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, part of my work here is training graduate students, working with them on their projects and so forth. Before that, I spent some time teaching at the community college level in a two-year program for nanoscience technology and uh, worked with a number of the people that eventually became technicians in a number of areas. Also worked with placing some of those students in industry uh, positions. So very, very, very much believe in the two-year programs. I think it's uh, it's worthwhile uh, kind of surveying the whole field of nanotechnology jobs and careers because they are so varied. Uh, one can uh, do nanotechnology, work with nanotechnology, at a number of different levels. Uh, one uh, that comes to mind is an engineer. Could be a, an engineer in the electrical and computer engineering, could be material science or chemical engineering, it could be a biomedical engineer. But these are typically bachelor's level engineers that are working to develop new materials or devices or processes to make those devices that all operate at something, has some uh, procedure or some part of the operation 
that involves knowledge of the nanoscale, nanoscale materials. Uh, what we're picturing here is uh, a person working in the microelectronics sector, which is uh, extremely timely because right now there's a great deal of effort to expand our workforce in microelectronics. Uh, also, besides engineering, one could be a, a scientist. Typically, that involves an advanced degree, uh, a master's or a PhD, maybe an MD. And there you might be researching new materials that have a nanoscale component, or you're working with materials that are strictly at the small scale of nanotechnology. And uh, this is more of an academic track, although you might find your job working in industry or a national laboratory as well. Uh, Peter did a great job of describing the many opportunities of technicians. I think technicians are the, the, the hands that make our technologi technological world work. And so these folks are involved in, as uh, Peter mentioned, in uh, life sciences with Genentech or the um, uh, microelectronics industry, like at uh, analog devices. They may be involved in materials uh, and analysis in a laboratory. They might be working with uh, quality control and quality assurance in a manufacturing environment. They might be doing things like supporting uh, the tools in a clean room, uh, vacuum technology, electromechanical support. All of these uh, jobs are essential in uh, uh, many, many manufacturing industries, in particular microelectronics. So this is, this is an expanding area, and the federal government has certainly noticed this and is supporting more job development, more workforce development in the technician area. Uh, it's a real attractive option uh, for those students of yours that may not want, don't feel they're cut out for a four-year program, may be in a bigger hurry <laughs> to get into the workforce, uh, perhaps they're a returning veteran. And uh, these are all uh, the kinds of folks that do well with um, the, these two-year technician programs. In general, though, you can, might uh, find yourself working in a large number of industries where a knowledge of the nanoscale phenomena of nanomaterials is important. Uh, you might be working with um, aircraft uh, coatings. You might be working with paints and resistive uh, alloys. You might be working with um, um, uh, glass treatment and so forth. All of these areas uh, have something to do with material at the nanoscale. And in in I didn't even mention the medical uh, arena where you might be working with uh, administering drugs that are in nanoparticle form, but need to be, you need to have some understanding of how they interact with cells that, of the patient. So an end user is another area where knowledge of nanotechnology can lead to real rewarding careers. Now, <clears throat> oftentimes students and their parents will say, okay, no, I don't see any job ads for nanotechnologists. You know, where are the jobs? Are there jobs? Well, it's, uh, it's such a broad area that these job titles can all be part of a nanotechnology career. Uh, the, everything listed here can or oftentimes do, does have a, a component that requires understanding of material at the nanoscale and uh, the applications of the techniques of nanotechnology. So uh, when, you're, when you or your students are starting to say, well, hmm, do I wanna work in the nanotechnology area? What do I look for? It's pretty broad. So you can look at a, a number of these different uh, uh, applications or job titles. Where would you work? Uh, where would you work? Well, you probably work in a number of areas, predominantly, again, microelectronics, a very, very large consumer of trained individuals who uh, understand how things work at the nanoscale, because that's the scale at which we build the transistors that go into integrated circuits. So working for large companies or small, uh, electronics, microelectronics, micro devices, a big area where nanotechnologists end up working. Another area is in the specialty materials area, say for 3M or uh, HP Fuller or applied material, or um, DuPont. These are people that are using chemical methods to make nanoparticles to form the basis of some product. Could be paints or coatings or inks. It could be the uh, active elements in a display screen. It could be uh, nanofibers that are going to be used for a biomedical filter. Uh, so all these, all these areas are, uh, rely upon people with an understanding of the formation and the analysis, characterization of nanomaterials, nanoparticles, nanorods, et cetera. Another big area is in the biomedical field, and that's, uh, pr uh, I've got a couple of examples here on the screen of, of pharmaceutical applications of nano. So if you were a nanotechnologist, you would have been working uh, on the development of the COVID vaccine. That uh, figure in the lower right uh, of the image is a small nanoparticle made of lipids, fat uh, molecules, that is uh, has been engineered to convey the messenger RNA that uh, is designed to evoke the immune response by, uh, by patients. So 
that is a, a very definite uh, application of nanoscience and nanotechnology, and you'd be working in the pharmaceutical area. Another hot area is engineering small nanoparticles and decorating their surface with uh, drugs, drug molecules, as well as proteins. And these proteins help that nanoparticle find its way to the site of action so that the drug uh, molecule can be delivered directly to, say, a cancer tumor and not uh, flood the patient's body with a high level of this uh, potentially toxic medicine. So nano, nanotechnology, nanotechnologists work for pharmaceutical companies as well. I'm going to leave you with a couple of references that I'm going to highlight nano.gov, which is uh, <laughs> where we're at as well. And, there, and there's plenty of other educational materials online. One example, the National Geographic has got a nice uh, site that says, uh, uh, kind of gives you a nice overview of what nanotechnology is, where it can be used. Nanotechnology training programs. I want to sing the praises of the Micro Nanotechnology Education Center, Mintech, that the, they are really the national source of uh, information about jobs, training, for the two-year level uh, uh, in particular, but also other engineering positions as well. And then uh, we have a couple of, of places to look for uh, career paths uh, among them, um, Mintech's uh, website. Also our own NNCI uh, website, we do have a nice careers page there. Those are places to start. Uh, always, uh, there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of information out there and uh, welcome you to, to uh, begin looking. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for our other panelists. Uh, with that, I would love to open the Q&A. I would ask uh, people to please uh, introduce yourself, tell us where you're, where you're calling from, and then go ahead with your question. I'll take moderator's prerogative uh, uh, while people lose their shyness. Uh, I'm curious. There's something that I always hear students ask, and we normally industry tries to shy away from, from answering. But what is the typical range of salaries that students can expect at the different levels, or maybe maybe not the different levels, but the different industries? Is that something that's, uh, that's answerable? Well, Maria, I can speak to uh, technicians that we've interviewed. So if I can uh, just quick screen share here. Um, so the technicians we've interviewed, uh, if they're doing shift work, they're making between 22 to 25, even some of $28 an hour. Um, if they're getting paid yearly, uh, those technicians are making uh, between 50 and $70,000 a year. And uh, the technicians are also getting uh, benefits packages like healthcare, uh, as well as um, retirement packages included too. So for those technicians, uh, they make a pretty good uh, yearly uh, rate. Uh, the one other thing that the uh, shift work technicians have often mentioned is they also get differentials. So if they work weekends or they work nights, they get paid more. Um, and if they work overtime, they also get paid more. So there are ways to stretch even beyond making uh, $70,000 a year. But uh, that's uh, really for technicians. I can't speak for the engineers or other positions. My, my colleague, uh, Mikhail Thomas at uh, Georgia Tech has a really good uh, set of information here, and I wish I had that at hand. But it seems I think bachelor's level engineers, you know, typically it depends on size of company and geographic area, but certainly um, mid 80,000s to 90 to start and going up into the uh, six figures is, uh, is, uh, is pretty common. And then if there's a step into management uh, or, uh, you know, higher levels of supervisory capacity, there's a there's a bump on that as well. And I think just to add on another resource, um, which I just dropped in the chat, is through the SEMI Foundation. It's specific to semiconductor careers, but it's really current information and includes sort of an interest survey that students can take that can match them with potential jobs and gives you some information about education required and average salary. And I think that's another uh, really good resource. Thank you. Any other questions? Come on, don't be shy. 
Okay, another question. Okay, there's a question in the chat. I got a direct question for, I guess, for everyone. Um, we have a, a Charles is interested, is lives in Baja, Mexico, and is interested in starting an education program here and suggestions of where to start. Uh, when you mean education program, you mean nanotechnology, I'm assuming. Any um, any pointers for the educators in the group? Well, I think very few uh, four-year uh programs exist for it's strictly nanoscience. You know, it, te it tends to be much more uh, an understanding that you're going to study one of the more fundamental science disciplines or engineering disciplines and then have a nanoscience flavor to it, depending on how uh, your, your your professor's interest or your own interest. So that, that tends to be um, the way it's done, at least in the United States. I know at the two-year level, at the two-year college level, we don't have nearly as many programs as I'd like to see in nanoscience, but we do have some and they are they are more focused on um, a, the, the subset of, of scientific skills and understanding that you will need to apply it directly to some sort of nanoscience career. So I think if you're, if you're interested in nanoscience particularly, uh, a two-year program is a, is a good option. If you'd like to be more of an engineer or scientist with a nanoscience direction, then a bachelor's degree, maybe leading to an advanced degree would be, would be my suggestion. Yes, at UCSD, we have a nanoengineering uh, program. So uh, you focus actually uh, on, you know, nano nanoscale uh, phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think we're one of the rare universities to, to have that. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, wherever you are, um, most of the time you apply, uh, you know, nanotechnology to your field of expertise, uh, drug development, nanocarriers, liposome, COVID-19 vaccine up to, uh, you know, uh, medical devices where you will use, uh, you know, some uh, nano sensors, you know, to detect uh, whatever you try to catch. We had a big program here that was called the uh, RADEX RAD, big program for the NIH, <clears throat> where we helped 49 universities across the nation to develop COVID-19 vaccine, um, no, sorry, COVID-19 uh, detection technology. And um, so we had the emergency use authorizations, you know, and we had all these people trying to develop their technology as fast as possible, and we provided resources for that. And, uh, you know, none of the technologies that they developed, none of them did not have nanotechnology. In other words, everybody had nanotechnology in their devices. It was not even a question. It was yes. definitely integrated to the, to the process. Yeah, I think I need to expand on that. Nanotechnology has become an enabling tech. Uh, when I went to undergrad, there were more nano nano degrees. I, my undergrad is in nanomedicine engineering. It does not exist anymore. But I think a traditional a student right now could have the same education I had by going to biomedical engineering because now most of the uh, cutting ed edge uh, research in that field is in the nanospace. Um, there is another question that was sent to me as a direct message. Um, and please, I, I understand if you guys are shy, I'll, I'm happy to read them, but please feel free to also just unmute yourself. Um, to the group, uh, I'm new to this. Can you please explain the difference between nano and quantum or how they're related? Who wants to take this one? Well, I'm, I'm a physicist, so let me take, <laughs> take a whack at it. <laughs> Um, the, the quantum realm really refers to the uh, length scale of atoms or even smaller. So if you think about the hierarchy of sizes and you think about things going smaller from our everyday experience down to the quantum realm, you start with, uh, you know, things, things that we can measure in meters or millimeters. These are familiar to us in everyday life. If we go down, uh, down to the and another thousand times smaller than a millimeter, we have a, a micrometer. A micrometer, uh, as a point of reference, a human hair is about 100 micrometers thick. So we go down to a micrometer, we go down a thousand times smaller than that, we are at the nanometer scale. So the nanometer scale, that's, that's, that's where we're at. We're about a thousand times smaller than a uh, bacterium. We are about, a, we are at the, or, but we're much, much larger than an atom. So the nanoscale is actually 
somewhat, it's extremely small. It's smaller compared to our everyday environment, but it's bigger than the quantum realm, which is another factor of 10 or 100 times smaller, where the quantum effects really are pronounced. Now, when you're working with things on an order of a nanometer or, or 10 nanometers, the quantum effects do start to show up. But as we go into larger scales, our everyday experience, quantum effects are, are kind of masked by uh, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But so when we're talking about quantum and doing things at the quantum scale or doing quantum computing, we're really truly talking about things at the on the length scale of an atom or maybe even uh, the tenth or a hundredth of that down to the size of, a, of an electron. In other words, small is not just small. There's a hierarchy of small. And so nano is a little bit less small than quantum. Well said. <laughs> um, I'm putting a um, something in the chat that's really fun for students. It is um, an interactive uh, that allows you to zoom all the way from macro um, all the way down through, um, as you said, uh, micro, um, milli, micro, nano, and then... Pico, Pico and beyond, right, and all the way, all the way down to the um, the scale of uh, string string theory. It's mm -hmm. a really it's a really fun interactive for students. And I will read out uh, Quinn's joke: Nano and quantum are entangled. It is a joke, but it is a real thing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> entangled, an inside joke. <laughs> um. Uh, I see that there's some questions about summer internships, and Peter just uh, shared on one of them. Um, is there any other internships that the group would like to to share if you're available? Several of us belong to the NNCI network, and a number of uh, the nodes of the NNCI do sponsor uh, summer internships in some form. Uh, Stanford has been a, a real leader in this. It has a large uh, cohort of interns. We work with our local uh, community colleges primarily and some also as, uh, local liberal arts colleges to give those students an opportunity to come in, work in our laboratories, work in a microfabrication clean room or working in a nanomaterial, a nanoparticle lab that gives them the opportunity over the summer. So if you're if you're close to one of the people in our network, you know, that that would be the opportunity. If you if you uh, want to seek out one of our uh, programs, I'm sure we could share that information. And I will oh, ahead, I was gonna say, yeah, thanks, Jim, for the shout out. Um, yeah, at Stanford, we have community college internships. So not high school, but community colleges. And the applications actually just opened. Um, they're not summer internships. We run year round. Um, so our next hiring round will be to start in January. But then we usually also have another cohort um, at the beginning of the summer. And we were at 25 in the height of the summer this summer. And at UCSD, we have also an RU program. We accept uh, six to eight students every summer. Um, two questions. Uh, uh, where is like the best place in the United States for a lot of these internships? And second question, would you recommend a chemical or an electrical engineering background for um, this type of work? Electrical engineering is good. UCSD is the best place in the nation. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> uh, but yes, electronic engineering is very much in line with uh, with this industry. Um, and, uh, you know, I, depending on where you want to go, what you want to do as a career, uh, you know, the, the background is good. I don't know about anyone yeah. Chemical engineers are also very, very well suited, so well situated to contribute to microelectronics work because you know, a lot of the chemicals and the chemical resists have to be engineered. Uh, they're also working with uh, nanostructured materials. Maybe someday the chemical engineers will figure out how to 3D print integrated circuits and they'll put all the electrical engineers <laughs> to the side. So, you know, I think both of those are very, very solid preparations for a career in nanotechnology. I would also throw a hat in the ring for material science engineers because mm -hmm. uh, nano, a huge area of materials exploration. And I think of, I always think of material science engineers as kind of the mechanical engineers of the nano world, right? High utility across many different areas. Um, so that's my vote. Yeah, material science is all over the place. It's, you know, it's extensively used. 
Uh, if you work as a, an engineer uh, in the future, you know, it's most likely that you, we, you, you will work in a team. You don't work by yourself. There's a lot of expertise needed. Uh, one field that you may want to explore is called systems engineering, uh, which is basically the best practice in developing, you know, devices that help society. So you may want to look into systems engineering, and you'll see there that there is a, a well-established uh, framework uh, that actually uh, enables, you know, teams that undertake uh, engineering projects to perform uh, optimally. And if I could jump in and say a little more about material science and engineering, something that's interesting about many programs is that it's they're what I call upside down. So they have very large graduate student populations and smaller undergrad populations. This happens because people from a number of different majors, such as chemical engineering, of course, materials, physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, mechanical, go into material science engineering as a grad student. What's interesting in many engineering disciplines, what I see a lot at Purdue is people switching around between departments. So just keep in mind that what you study as an undergraduate can be a little bit different from what you do as a grad student. Probably not entirely different, but you can also consider different, slightly different majors. With these conversations about internships, I would like to ask a question to Lillian. How did you find out about the internship that you're currently in and what kept you interested in nanotechnology? So um, how I found out about the program was through like um, the newsletter from my school. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like a newsletter of like all the opportunities and stuff. So that's how I happened to stumble upon like this internship. Um, yeah and then like like and then I got accepted into it and I was like after doing the tour or getting the tour of the facility and just like everyone like the mentors and just like meeting the staff it was like an amazing experience and um during my internship like I got to learn about like things I never like knew was possible for me to learn as a community college student and just being very involved in projects like any questions I have there's always like a like a staff member to answer them it's just a very like like the environments like help me like develop skills that um I think will be useful for like future like careers and stuff awesome and curious have you thought about what you want to do after you graduate um yes I actually <laughs> okay so originally I came in um like planning to do electrical engineering but as like I worked with the tools and stuff it kind of gravitated me more towards mechanical because I like more hands-on especially when I got to like work with um like just help um just develop recipes and just help um, do maintenance. But as I think more about it, I think I'm gravitating towards materials engineering because like, I just, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, this brings like back to what we were talking just now, how like they're all kind of related and uh, you could probably stay in the area that you like studying either of the three things that you just mentioned. And that's what makes nano so cool because of how interdisciplinary it really is. Yeah. Yeah. I like every time I come in, I learn something new. <laughs> that's why I liked about this internship. So there you go. Promote it with your students. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question from the group? I have a question for the teachers. When, uh, when, how often does the conversation in your classroom turn to careers or turn to what people want to do? And how often do you hear them say, I want to do some sort of science, technology, engineering uh, pathway? Open it to anybody. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? The, the question is, uh, do you have uh, these discussions of career uh, readiness, career preparation, career interests in, the, in your classroom? And if so, are they heading uh, in the science and engineering direction, the science and technology direction, uh, or, or, or not? Or, or roughly, you know, what, what is the level of interest? You know, this is very, very important to us as practitioners in this field. We need to know that the pipeline is being backfilled. And so, you know, what, what's the interest level? I'm kind of curious. 
Okay. I, I would like to start that conversation because this is a lament of mine. <clears throat> and it is that at, in the K-12 space, and particularly in the middle and high school um, arenas, um, uh, there is precious little that is going on regarding careers and career focus. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> and so I, I'm, I'm constantly talking, I'm, I, I teach in high school and I'm constantly talking to my students about engineering and, um, and I, and, and they're not getting the message from anyone else. Mm -hmm. So it's desperately important that we start to, um, target kids at these ages and to get them, make them aware. They don't, they don't even know, um, you know, like there are 500 different careers in a hospital, one of which can be operating a scanning electron microscope in the basement. Right. Yeah. But they don't, all they know, doctor, nurse, and janitor, like that's all they know. And so there are so, there's such, um, there's, there's a gap between, you know, the world of uh, Mintech and the world of nano, you know, for, you know, the two-year community colleges and the, the students, there's, there's a gap. There really isn't a pipeline. And I, and I haven't figured out how to fix it, but what I'm doing is I'm jumping up and down saying there are jobs, there are good jobs and engineering is awesome. And, and tech is important and quantum is important. And, and, but, uh, but that's one person in one school. <laughs> You're doing important work. Thank you. Well, but we have to figure out how to bridge that gap. Yeah. Frank, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the last, Several years I've been working on a K through eight uh, curriculum called FOSS, and we do have modules for middle school and elementary uh, about materials, and we also include a career database with one of our, uh, with our middle school modules about you know if you want to study the science, this is the careers available, but nanotechnology is not represented in our materials and in our uh, career database, um, but we don't have the funds to to uh, incorporate that. So, um, so uh, yeah, I came here to hoping to see if there's any K through eight stuff available. And, um, but I mean, this like, is mostly focused on community college and high school, which, K through I, eight, which uh, is we, so. We, yeah, we have developed uh, the, 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 the NNC of the National Nanotechnology Network uh, under various names has developed a lot of really good educational modules can be dropped into Many science curricula, many science classes at at maybe not K level, but you know certainly grades five and up. There's these are these are ready made uh, uh, educational resources, uh, lessons, uh, questions, worksheets that are all already developed. So uh, we can I, I can put the address in the chat. And you can follow up if you're interested. Yeah, and Frank, I'd like to add on to that because I run a a middle school teacher professional development um, called NanoSims which is definitely focused on introducing the idea of nano to middle schoolers. And we're working on building up career resources for that. Um, so it's a paid opportunity for teachers. And there's been a lot of interest in a lot of different areas to put money into that program, to expand it in different ways to help raise career awareness. So that's definitely top of mind as we're um, kind of iterating new, new versions of it. Um, so please reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat. Let's have a conversation about that. Um, because I think like Jim said, there's just, there is a wealth of resources out there. It's just, they're hidden. <laughs> and if you don't know where to find them, and fortunately, cause I was a, I was a teacher. I was a K, I was a high school teacher for 25 years who loved nano. So I like Marielle, I'm aware of a lot of different resources in a lot of different places. So we just want to help increase access to these already existing resources um, and it's a much more cost efficient way than trying to start from ground zero and work your way up. Molly, please go ahead. Uh, so I am brand new to all of this. I just started a job with Montana State University and I'm doing outreach on quantum and nano and um, with a focus focus on youth. And so I am just starting to learn about these resources. So thank you for sharing, Daniela. That's super helpful. Like um, just to, to start to get my uh, quiver of activities filled. Um, but one of the things we just recently did here was had an entire curriculum built, um, at least at the quantum level for K 
kids, especially girls and young kids. Um, but the question that you had originally asked was about whether or not students are hearing about this. And there, I think there are more and more, there's more and more recognition that people outside of schools need to step in because I would echo what someone else said about this stuff isn't necessarily being brought up in school. And I've had my career in informal ed and informal science education. And over and over again, we see that just through schools, kids are not necessarily getting the message about this, um, about going into science and engineering. So there's a lot of interest among the kids that I see outside of school. Um, so luckily people um, are in my position and Daniela's position where we're able to work with teachers and students who have the interest and help try to develop that. Do we need a TikTok channel developed to... Uh deliver all of this sort of stuff. Instagramming. <laughs> well, our interns have an Instagram account. I can put okay. that in, the, in that that's sort of a first window that's trying to meet kids where they're at in a language that I don't speak, right, Lillian? Um, that's why we have our interns that actually create the material so that they can speak to students on the level that they're at, um, as opposed to us oldies. Not that everyone's old, <laughs> but, you know, we're not Gen Z, that's for sure. <laughs> but Jim, you do have a point though, because I do think that um, there's a lot of value to going to where students are, right? And so we need that funded. Like, I, I don't think that that's something that like any of us, any of us are going to be able to do on our, you know, time off, but we, uh, we need people, we need, you know, young faces and we need a scripted, something that, that we can, you know, use to engage to engage young people. Because increasingly I'm seeing information about careers on TikTok actually. So, I mean, it's, it's, it is a valid channel. Um, I also wanted to add uh, that I'm putting in the chat that um, we have a listserv. Uh, well, it's a, it's a Google group of people interested in um, nano education. And so I'm putting that link in the chat right now. So if you have, if you would like to be notified of additional opportunities like this, then you can join the group and then you'll get those emails. Thank you, Marielle. That also, it's a good reminder for me to tell everyone that um, we have an, an ongoing Google Doc. We, all the resources that we've shared um, in the past sessions for the last two and a half years. So I'm gonna put that in the chat as well. Um, if you're interested to learn more and to see what we've discussed in the past, this is a great resource. And I would give a specific shout out to the episode where you learn about the RAIN network, which is a wonderful way to introduce students to microscopy and its remote use of all different kinds of microscopy tools. And they and Eves is part of the RAIN network. They do an amazing job of reaching schools and your students can send in samples or they can use samples that are there and they get to set up a time and it's it's really, it's become and evolved to be really easy to use. Back in the day when I first started, it was not, and I, I was not happy with it. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, but now in the last like five years, I think since COVID it's awesome. So I would give, I would give a strong shout out to that. And I can put the link or Eves, you can put the link in the chat to rain. Rain um, standing for remote access to instruments of nanotechnology. Or is that how it goes? And the remote access to that's a great instrumentation. I, I instrumentation, always think... yeah. I uh, so the, the idea is remote, just... it's a remotely accessible instrument for nanotechnology. Not even there close. We go. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the idea is that that does so, uh, give your students access to these very expensive tools. You don't have to be present to be operating them. You can you can look over the operator's shoulder essentially and see how uh, an operator doing this sort of thing, working with a scanning electron microscope, would operate. That's kind of a it's a, a building interest in a career right there. So Actually, I, I put you can... my uh, email address if you want to. Uh, UCSD does a lot of these uh, SEM remote sessions. You can email me directly, or uh, Daniela, do you have the rain the rain link as well? Because I I don't have attendee. Yeah, I just dropped it in the chat. Okay, and super. you can not only be over their shoulder. But if you have a mouse uh, attached to your computer, you can actually remotely control the scanning electron microscope, which is which is very very impressive to students mm -hmm. and exciting. And I would love it's to great. say that this is free; it's free to use. And if you, the only thing you need is Zoom, which we are all very familiar with by now. 
We accept donations. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi. Maybe a stupid question, but um, all of the stuff you said that you have in the meeting chat is great, but will we get a maybe either a transcript or a list of links at the end of this, maybe emailed out? Yes. So um, I will send an email to everyone that registered today with a link to the recording of this session, the Google Doc, and normally at the at the Google in the Google Doc, I'll update the links shared during the session. So you'll have everything that was shared in the chat. I'll just put the links there. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, those resources are super helpful when you're trying to make these meaningful experiences for kids. It's kind of about making science fun and showing kids that this could be your job. Um, I work in like a Title I school, so a lot of kids don't necessarily have careers like in their minds because it can be driven by families. Um, and so you sometimes have to do grassroots organization because like generally in teaching, it's mostly on content and test scores sure you know um and so something like nano education it aligns with the ngss standards but you know um working with other educators people find it to be very high level um and i you know you get feedback sometimes with just like you know when you're trying to meet kids where they are um, but it is amazing uh, resources and they have all sorts of fun learning experiences that I think can give kids to conceptualize the other careers other than just being a doctor, a nurse, or sometimes computers, video game creator, yeah. they'll say. Um, not necessarily material science because I think it's a little bit more niche. Thank you. And I just want to give that shout out again that if you're in the Bay Area, Stanford, we are having that open house. And part of the open house, we actually have industry meet and greets. So it's opportunity for students to talk to people in the industry and, and ask them about what they do and what it's like um, from different companies in the Bay Area. Um, so if you're near Stanford on National Nano Day, come join Lillian and I in, uh, in sharing what, what we have going on at Stanford. Um, I would like to add on to that. Um, we have like other interns that would or that are gonna present their own research project or their own projects they're working on. So it's something um like if that interests you guys to see what we actually do as interns, um, we have it on open house. <laughs> I think it's also a good time to plug again that if you want a nano scientist or nano engineer or maybe a nano intern, we can we can maybe arrange it um, to visit your classroom for Nano Day, October 9th. Please reach out. I will put the the announcement again in the chat because I know some people uh, join after the original announcement. We are playing matchmakers. So if you want to have someone talk to your students and tell them about the day in the life of a nano scientist, we can make that happen. You all are getting my uh, creative ideas flowing, thinking like we should do like an Instagram live at our open house to, you know, talk about meeting students where they are. <laughs> and that, that would be something that would be a way to do that, even though I have no idea how that works. Lillian, we'll talk. Oh, I have nothing to add on to that. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to follow up with what Michael said. Um, so you're starting to, to introduce nanotechnology in your classroom. Where are you getting the resources from? Uh, did you participate in one of the REUs? Oh, uh, I'm, I did the nano Smith with uh, Daniela. It's actually Wonderful. fabulous. And I have a background in chemistry, so I can like integrate my own things uh, in terms of trying to do the sustainability community project and stuff. But, I also try to use cur other curriculum resources to try to give that to my students. Very cool. Any last questions?
comments or concerns or ideas on how you're going to celebrate Nano Day. Okay, with that, um, I would love to thank our speakers one more time. Thank you, Peter, Jim, and Lillian for your time. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I hope um, everyone learned something new and you have some new information to share with your students. As we repeated a couple of times, you'll get the recording and the list of all the resources that we've shared. And I hope to see you in our next uh, NanoEd Forum. It will be in November, and we'll be announcing the details soon. Thank you again, and have a good afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.